Here we go. All right, I believe this is where we left off. And uh, if you remember, we, when we ended last class, we were talking about the Milgram studies. And that is where uh, we had a teacher and a learner, and we had an individual who was kind of the authority figure, a guy in a gray uh, um, medical experiment or, or a, a type of jacket. And he was representing the authority figure. And uh, the, the subject was always going to be the teacher. But what happens is as the student, uh, uh, the, the kind of false student would get a false answer, he would uh, flip a switch on a shock box, which went from 15 volts up to 450 volts at an increment of 15. And uh, just as a, a, a reminder, in the Milgram study, um, what Milgram wanted to know is how many people would actually shock someone up to 450 volts. And when he went and talked to his psychiatrists and master and graduate students and everything, uh, they all said only about one or 2% of individuals would um, do that because that's a sadistic behavior, right? Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, from what we know, they were absolutely wrong. In fact, about two-thirds of people will go up to 450 volts. And indeed, uh, you can get anyone from 10 to 90% of individuals uh, go up to that. If you see someone else go up to 450 volts, 90% of people go up to 450 volts. If you see someone else stop, uh, the experiment, only 10% go up to 450 volts. So he's kind of quantifying uh, the willingness to commit evil, if you want to think about it that way. Okay. Now, what Milgram originally wanted to do is to show how so many people in the German culture uh, at, this, at that time, uh, Germany was considered one of the uh, high places of intellectualism, a high place of... of um, uh, they had the finest universities in, in, in the world. And they were actually, uh, before the Nazis took over Germany, they were the least anti-Semitic country in the world, in, in the European continents. Indeed, a lot of people think that uh, Germans were always anti-Semitic. But the truth being, it wasn't until the Nazis and Hitler started to introduce his pop propaganda that uh, Germany became one of the more, uh, less of a refuge to the Jewish population. And he wanted to know what could make someone do that based on an authority figure. And from his studies, we kind of got nine elements um, in order to kind of create evil in the world or, or to get normal good people to do horrific things, as you would say. Uh, the first one is a con contractual obligation. So when we look at the Milgram studies, the participants agreed to come and do the experiment. They were paid up front. So there was some type of um, obligation, even though in the contract it stated that they could leave or end the experiment at any time. Uh, a meaningful role. So, tell, so for example... Um, telling individuals that they're coming in to help us understand something ambiguous as learning and giving them the role of a teacher uh, of importance. Rules make sense, but ambiguous enough to be arbitrary, okay? Uh, when we look at the Nazis' rules against Jewish, they never directly said to, for example, exterminate the Jews, but it was implied, okay? Use semantics such as teaching instead of hurting. Okay, diffusion of responsibility. When the when the individual when the individual started to complain to the authority figure, the authority figure would say, "Don't worry, I'll take responsibility. Continue on, teacher." Small incremental acts uh, that starts with the fifteen volts. When when um, Milgram was testing his his method, he, he found that if you started with 450 volts, no one would do it. 
you have to sm start with a small incremental um, increases in punishment, as you would say. Um, and that's kind of that gradual progression as well. So the gradual progression is in the beginning, the learner would give the right answers, but then over time would start answering wrong, which would then progress the, the amount of shocks that the uh, teacher would provide. Okay. Uh, exit costs are high and difficult and offering an ideology, a big idea. So in this one, it was helping us learn how uh, how humans uh, learn, as you would say, and saying you're, 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 you're contributing to the field of science and to the field of understanding human conditions. If we look at, again, World War II, the idea is, the idea was is that Germany could be a world power. It could really provide the world with good and valuable individuals given their race and their nationality. Okay. So we find that these elements can create uh, conditions in which people, good everyday people, would uh, do kind of horrific things. And, and let's go on to some exemplifiers. If you remember, uh, and again, this was last Tuesday, I asked the class and the majority said, no way, uh, but how many individuals would uh, shock a little puppy dog after you've got to know it? Um, and how many would do it clear up to that 450 volts like in Milgram studies, okay? So we're gonna set up a condition. This time, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put the student with someone, an authority figure that the student has a relation, some type of relationship. So we're gonna use high school and college teachers. And we're gonna do this experiment at the end of a semester when, when the students and the teachers get to know each other, okay? And what the procedure is gonna be is the little doggy is going to, uh, the, 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 the student has to teach the doggy some tricks, okay? Now the dogs were actually trained not to ever learn the tricks uh, but but the idea was is so in the slow incremental way, how many individuals would go clear up to 450 volts because of a known authority figure that someone you have a re, kind of a professional in this case relationship with. And what we found is when you know the authority figure and you have a relationship with them, at least in this study, what we found is that was there was about a 75% uh, increase, compliance increase um, uh, in the shocking. So we went from two thirds to three fourths of everyone which would shock the dog, okay? And in this one, there was actually a difference based on gender. In Milgram's original studies, there was no difference between uh, men and women. In this one, uh, about 54% of males would obey the, the, the instructions from the experimenter, while 100% of the females went all the way based on the instruction, okay? Now, I always get, does that mean, is this evidence? And, and I've had some male students use this as, an, as proof that women are more evil than men. Um, the truth is, is no, okay? While only 54% of the males went up to 450 volts, none of them uh, protested. None of them said, no, and this, it's not right, it, it's not correct. No, they manipulated their way out of it. So they would say, oh, the shock machine broke down, or they would say, oh, the dog learned the trick, even though the dog couldn't learn the trick. And so instead of saying that, hey, this is wrong, what you're doing to this puppy, they, they, they basically manipulated their way out of it. So, which kind of reduces the evidence that women are more evil than men because it sounds like men are just more manipulative, okay? Are you saying that a lot of those people would be the bandwagon effect to kind of get other people on to see another person doing it, whereas they wouldn't have done it before? Well, they did it in, in isolation. 
So they did it all individually. So there wasn't, they were not doing it at the same time. And they didn't know, they didn't realize what the other individuals did. So it was what we call a double blind um, um, experiment. So, but we'll get into later on getting to your point when we get to group influence, we will actually look at the bandwagging, bad bandwagging, bandwagon uh, <laughs> uh, phenomenon. <laughs> All right. So I always had in, in a lot of my classes, uh, students who go, oh, this is ridiculous, Dr. Peterson. No one would ever do that. And no one would ever do something foolish, like believe in false information or or uh, just because an authority figure stated it. So um, one thing that I used to do in my Psych 101 classes, especially when I got a lot of people who said, ah, oh, that's a bunch of crap, is I, I came up with an idea once. It was on a, kind of on the drive home where I said, oh, how can I get students to um, uh, do this? And I decided I was going to do a lecture. It's totally made up, totally bogus, about personality is predicted by your foot size and shape. Okay. And I came up with these crazy things like if your big toe is smaller than your is is smaller than smaller than your toe next to it, it meant you were extroverted. And, you know, if you were above a size 12, you were open to experience. Uh, really just a bunch of bogus stuff. Okay. But the measure was in a measure about three weeks later. So I gave a quiz and we did another activity. And then in a kind of a survey quiz that I did, I asked whether students believed in, actually believed that your foot could predict your personality. Okay. And indeed, 85% of my students said, yes, that's a completely valid theory. Okay. Now think about that because this is my point's going to be is even in this class, I think I said it at the beginning of the semester too, when the student said, said something about an idea behind um, disorders and where they come from is don't believe an authority figure just because an authority figure says it. Even question your professors, because I could be just telling you a bunch of crap right now, and who would know it, right? And so the, the point of this being is, is, is when you look at expertise, when you look at authority figures, know that they may not have the knowledge that, that they're actually trying to uh, express and know that you can be... Um, kind of made to believe something that's not true, okay? Kind of a soapbox moment. So. But let's look at some other real life kind of experiments. So let's look at, when, at um, situations where uh, there's clear lines of authority, okay? But there's expertise that says you should do something else besides what you're going to do. So this is what we're going to do in this situation. We're going to get a bogus doctor. If you know anything about an ER, they have a list of doctors who are actually able to practice in that ER. So we pick someone who is, wasn't, he wasn't even a doctor, but his name did not exist on the ER role. Okay. And uh, the, the story goes is he would call the uh, nurse and we'd have a confederate in one of the rooms um, uh, and, and uh, that, that was a fake patient. And the fake doctor would call in and said, hey, nurse so-and-so, will you go give uh, this patient uh, 50 cc's of this, this certain medication, okay? Uh, but th the nurse's training Plus the label on the bottle said that anything over 20 cc's could cause death, okay? Meaning that uh, the, the nurse knew from the medication when they were in psychopharm in pharmacology school in nursing that that was dangerous. And the label on the bottle says that it was dangerous. And the other thing about medications is medications are not supposed to be given until after a doctor has signed. Okay, they have to have a doctor's signature. But even in this situation, 22 out of 23 nurses tried to administer that lethal dose of medication. 
uh, by just a verbal doctor's order who the doctor didn't even exist. Okay. Now I will say the, the syringe, the, the, the vial was actually filled with water just in case we didn't stop them before they got to our fake patient. But um, uh, this is what we found. Now, I think that the one person who didn't administer, they probably should have given an award. Um, but, um, but that's what we found. On further um, evaluation, um, uh, we found that uh, based on surveys, 47% of nurses reported giving improper medication dosages uh, due to a doctor's order. So on survey method, we find that about half have done that. So this is good news if you have your uh, ex in the ER, you know, just call and say your doctor so-and-so and can you administer it to uh, Joe over there and, and, and Joe will be taken care of. Okay, just kidding. Um, don't, if you do that, don't say you learned that in this class, but um, just, just, uh, just saying, okay. But what is the difference between this and other situations, okay? Is that the, the medical culture is all based on a top-down process, that the doctor is kind of the ruler of the house, okay? And regardless of the level of training of individuals below them, they're, they're trained that you don't question the doctor, you don't question the authority figure. Okay. And as we can see in this uh, pseudo real situation, it could actually have deadly um, consequences. Uh, we've looked at, again, reports of, for example, and this is an example of when you, you feel like you can't question an authority figure. Okay. One thing that we should say about uh, uh, airlines is a captain, and then you have the first uh, uh, first officer, okay? And on purpose, the first officer is there to keep an eye on the captain and make sure the captain is uh, doing, is, is, is making the proper decisions and whatnot. But in the situation, you have a captain who is the authority figure, and then you have the first, first officer who is below that person in kind of that way. And we found that in analyzing about 27 airplane uh, accidents, in 81% of the cases, the root cause was due to the first officer not properly monitoring and challenging the captain, okay? So here we have a kind of real life example of, of obedience to authority, even when the individual knows that what they're doing is not correct. Okay. We'll skip this one. The other real life uh, kind of thing is what we call this, what was called the strip search scam. Okay. This happened in 68 situations over 32 in over 32 different states. Okay. So um, in this situation, what happened is the individual that was committing this, what should have been committing a crime, we'll talk about that in a little while, is he would call uh, local fast food restaurants after he found out that uh, he got the assistant manager's name and she usually was younger than, than most of the individuals there. And so, uh, but she was still in a place of authority. Okay. And they, they usually got an employee. Actually, let me change this. You had an assistant manager who was of an authority figure, and then you had some employee that usually was a young kind of, uh, I don't want to say naive, but just a, a person there that, that attracted the offender in some way. Okay. And what he would do is he would call the, the fast food restaurant and say, let, let, let's say the victim's name is Jill, okay? And he would say, this is officer so-and-so, but from here on out, I just want you to refer to me as sir, okay? So no longer officer so-and-so, this is sir so-and-so, okay? And what he said is, is, do you have an employee there by the name of Jill? And of course, the assistant manager cluelessly said, yes. Okay. And he, and he would say, well, here's the thing is we have 
a string of thefts that are happening at your fast food restaurants. And we think that Jill is one of the thieves. Okay. And what the, the, the request would be, could you, I I'm about an hour out. I'm on my way. Can you bring Jill to the back room and, and just keep her there and maintain her there? But so I know that she's there, put, put a phone on speakerphone so that I, I know what's going on. Okay. And the wanting to help assistant manager, sure enough, you know, brought the uh, uh, individual to the back room and, and said, okay, she's here. And the office, well, the sir uh, uh, would then say, well, um, Jill, are you guilty? And of course, what are you going to do if you're not guilty? You're going to say, abs you're going to protest, right? You're going to say, no, I'm not doing that. That's not me, right? And uh, the, the sir would say, well, prove it. Uh, assistant manager, uh, would you mind if your assistant manager patted you down? Uh, and of course, again, protesting and saying, I'm not this, go ahead. And so they'd have the assistant manager pro, uh, pat the individual down. And then remember that progression to, to the 450 volts. The next step was check the shoes. The next thing would be to check the socks. The next thing would be to check the shirt and have her take her shirt off, then take her pants off then take her bra off, and then take her panties off, okay? All along, the, the, the individual is going, describe it to me, describe her body, describe her body shape, tell me what's going on. And in about 50% of the 68 situation, it actually ended up in a sexual assault with the sir having them describe what they're doing to the assistant manager, okay? This happened in 68 different places in over 32 states. When they found the guy, he has actually never been charged for it because he didn't do the act. Indeed, the people that ended up getting uh, arrested for it was like the assistant manager and the individuals that helped with it. Okay. And so... Here's the situation with this one. Here you have an ambiguous authority figure in an ambiguous situation where you don't know what to do, but you want to do the right thing, okay? You want to do what's right. And the other thing that we know about fast food restaurants is that it's a, it's a clockwork thing. It's not something that takes a lot of cognition, you know, you you take the bun, you put the sauce on, the lettuce on, the, the patty on, and, and then you rotate it to the next person. So it's a systematic thing that you do. But in this ambiguous situation, you now have an authority figure telling you systematically what to do to help an investigation of wrongdoing. Okay. And so this is a real life situation, an example of an ambiguous authority figure taking advantage of a situational um, part, okay? I should note that 50%, all of those individuals, um, there was two that had priors. The remainder of the 48% the never had a record of sexual assault or sexual deviance before that moment. So, because I always get asked that, well, what, what was their criminal history? There were only two that had criminal histories. So, all right. And then can we get kids to, to uh, do something deviant? And, and uh, so we're going to see uh, there was a history teacher where, again, kind of like my situation with a foot and personality, when he asked, hey, can you think the Nazis could happen here? Can Nazi Germany happen here? A lot of these high school students said, absolutely not. We're the country of freedom, choice, all of those kinds of things. So what this teacher did is uh, he came to school one day and he said, okay, here's the thing that we found. And it was just a test and we need to start treating di students different. We found that the blue-eyed students in the classroom were intellectually superior than the brown-eyed students in the classroom. 
okay, and uh, wanted to know what would happen. And, and indeed, within about a week or two, the blue-eyed students started to harass and abuse the, uh, the, the brown-eyed students. They would actually start to wear insignias, demonstrating their superiority. They came up with flags. And they even started to develop um, a, a, a system. So they had the enforcers, they had the, the, the go-along people, and then they had the upper people, okay? And then, now you think being victimized would, would change someone, right? But what the teacher did after about two weeks of this is he came in and he said, oh, you know what, gang? We got it wrong. We were totally wrong about this. It's actually the brown-eyed students that are superior than the blue-eyed students, okay? And you would think that after being victimized, that that those students would be okay. We're gonna we're gonna play fair this time, but no. Within about two weeks, the brown eyed students started to treat the blue eyed students and started the bullying, the hurting, the flag waving, and all of those things, despite their victimization. Okay. In the end, uh, the 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 uh, the teacher brought the, the students into an assembly and says, you know what, after all your superiority and stuff, um, I want to let you know who your authority is. And he uh, opened this thing and put on TV to one of Hitler's first speeches to Nazi America. And he said, here's your proof that Nazi, Nazi Germany could happen here in America. Now, <laughs> it makes an interesting story. It's something that really Really happened, but he 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 didn't live, he didn't work there for very much longer after that. Uh, some teachers kind of, teachers and parents kind of got upset. So, but this is an example of simulation. Can something like this happen in the land of the free? Absolutely. It just takes those small little. You're better than they are. You have more authority than the, they do, and you could switch the clock back and forth whether you're a victim or an offender. Okay. All right. So let's go on to just a couple more examples of real life um, 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 situations. So we're going to go into uh, Germany, uh, nearing uh, kind of in the time when when uh, Hitler was uh, losing a lot of battles and a lot of uh, army, and so he was looking to recruit. Okay. Well, there was this little town in Germany named Hamburg. And um, what, what's unique about this town is it's isolated by mountain ranges, okay? And most people in this town knew really nothing about what was going on with the war. They didn't know much about, you know, what um, um, was going on. But then an army battalion, the Battalion 101, came in. And they said, hey, you know, what are you doing for Germany? What are you doing for our war effort? And now I want to note that in this town, even up clear up into the 1940s, their neighbors were Jews, Jewish. They, they got along. They ate together. They did business together. They were friends together. Their children played together. But when uh, this German uh, uh, battalion came in, they're like, no, you're not supposed to be liking them. And this is what we want you to do. And um, what happened is, and again, this was also an aging town. And so most of the men in the town were elderly. Okay, uh, Most above the age of 65. And just by the command of their German army, uh, they shot 38,000 Jews at point blank. And, 40, and they deported 45,000 of them to concentration camps. 90% of the germ, elderly German men in that town participated in this, meaning that only 10% refused, okay? And this, is, this, this has been used as an example of the power of nationality. When you invest in a national identity instead of an individual cultural identity, okay? Um, and as you probably have heard in the news, that's one of the biggest concerns in the United States is, ha is is that it, if you look at history, 
we're more moving more towards a nationalist country instead of a a, a free based country. So just something to to consider as you view the direction we're going here in the United States. All right, on this joyful topic, let's talk about suicidal bombers. Um, and so, uh, as everyone probably knows, this is an individual who willingly goes into a building strapped with uh, um, explosives around them and is willing to explode themselves in order to do something. And and a lot of people want to know, what, are these mindless fanatics? Are they individuals who are not um, educated or well off? Is this their last uh, straw? Or are they mindful martyrs, meaning they're doing this with a purposeful, rational reason? And so what, what we found is, is we went in, uh, um, there was, we, we found a, 400 Al-Qaeda members and that, that uh, were, were engaged in uh, planning a, a, either planning a, um, a, a suicide bombing or were being uh, coached into uh, being a, a, a suicide bomber, okay? And what we found is they tended to be what's called mindful martyrs, okay? We found that 75% of the 400 were middle to upper class. 90% had carrying intact families. Two-thirds had gone to college. Two-thirds were married. Most had had children. And this is something to think about to keep an eye on those engineering students. The majority of jobs were in science and engineering. Okay. So those, those little creeps are something. To, no, I'm kidding. We can make a lot of jokes about engineering students, but we won't. Um, so what creates this condition of these well intact individuals, why would they then go into something where they were going to ruin their family system, they were going to end their life, and that was going to be it, okay? And we found that there's basically two processes that have to be in place, okay? Um, one, there has to be conformity and social power, the need to belong and connect to others, okay? And uh, when we look at extremist groups, that's what they're all about, is they're saying, come here, you can be a part of us, and we're going to make some make you feel like you belong. Okay, and the second process is feeling effective or to influence others. Okay, this big idea that if I do this, my life will have meaning, it will have purpose, and and my family will be proud of me, and my 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 culture will be proud of my my religion will be proud of me. And it really only takes these two elements to convert somebody who is who is educated, intact family, uh, good jobs to do something to this level. Okay. All right. I'm gonna skip this. I'm going to skip this because we're going to talk about this when we get to mental. Okay. So, so that's, that's when we, when we look at how do people who would not normally act a certain way can be persuaded just by the social situation to act in a counter way to their belief system, to their values and to, to their attitudes. Now what we're going to talk about is something called compliance. Okay, and this is when we're acting according with a direct request of another person, not necessarily an authority figure, but uh, either a group or another individual. And uh, um, if you're a salesperson, this will probably look very familiar to you. Uh, if you're a car salesman, especially. Okay, and we found to get people to comply, there's really a couple techniques and they have kind of funny names, I think. Uh, the first one is the foot in the door technique, okay? This is compliance to a large request to gain a, a, a preceding it with, with a small request. So the research that was done in this area was uh, uh, 
Um, uh, the experimenter took big signs that something about, um, uh, you know, slowing down in traffic. But they had this huge sign in the beginning. And they went and asked, hey, can we put this huge sign in your yard? And most uh, in individuals that started with that wouldn't. They'd say, nah. But what they did is they changed it up. And what they did is that instead of starting with that large request, if they started with that large request and then came back and said, hey, would you be willing to put this little sign in your house, they got to a 90% compliance rate. So in this case, it's kind of like starting with uh, uh, an offer of uh, buy my car for 10 grand when it's only worth two, okay? And you start with that 10 grand, but then you say, okay, how about 5,000? Because of that reduction, people would even pay over 3,000 over the worth price of the vehicle. Hmm. They, they think they're getting a deal or they think that they're doing something um, of value uh, without having to do that large thing, if that makes sense. The second technique is what's called door in the face technique. This is compliance uh, gained by starting with a large unreasonable request that is turned down and then followed by a, a smaller request, more reasonable request. Oh yeah, I got these backwards. All right. <laughs> the first example I gave is an example of door in the face technique where you start with a large request and then go to a smaller one. The foot in the door technique is when you start with a small request and then ask for a larger request. And so we'll go back to the door, the, the, the big signs on the, the lawn. With other neighborhoods, what they found is people 75% of the time, if you started with, hey, will you just put this small sticker in your window? And then came back two weeks later and said, hey, since you put that small sticker in your window, can I put this large sign in your yard? And about 75% of people would, would go yes. Okay, where most none, most none of them, that's proper English for you, um, uh, would if you said put the large sign first, they would say no, absolutely not. Okay, so sorry for getting those backwards. I need to read my slides better. That's right. There you go. See, <laughs> even when it's yourself. <laughs> the next one is what's called the low ball technique, and this is a. Uh, Compliance to a costly request is gained by first getting compliance to an attractive, less less costly request by re-engaging re on its introductory offer. Okay, so this is this is um, for example. Um, The best example of this is when, uh, for example, you kind of hey, give selling a car as an example. And let's say, you know, here for this price, I'm going to put some alloy wheels on this. It's going to look really nice. Um, um, and, and I'm giving you a really good deal for this. Okay. And so this is my introductory offer. And, uh, and then it's going back and saying, this is kind of that let's do, we should add some more insurance on this. We should add, you know, for $250 more, you can get this insurance. You, so it's starting with exactly what you want and then adding things onto it, okay? Um, and the next one should sound familiar to, uh, based on television ads, and that's the not, that that's not all technique. This is compliance when a planned second request uh, with additional benefits is gained. So this is the, uh, um, you know, uh, buy this, uh, if you buy this car wax at $19.99 in the next 60 minutes, I'll add additional uh, bottle of car wax 
without changing the price. Okay. That kind of technique um, of just adding something of less value or something uh, to, to get compliance. Okay. So these are some things to try. Um, again, in the past, I've had students do these. So getting a, getting a, what you want for dinner. So I've had the students who say, you know, I want steak tonight. And so um, uh, they, they go do the low ball example and they go, hey, um, how does pizza sound? And of course, their, their roommate or their partner goes, oh, yeah, that sounds good. That sounds good. Do you know what sounds better than that? A good steak. And usually they'd end up with a steak or the opposite direction, go home and say, you know what? I want steak and lobster tonight. Let's say you want pizza instead. Uh, I want steak and lobster tonight. Can you take me for some, a nice steak and lobster? And of course, probably going to get a no, at least, at least in my house. Um, and then once you get that no, and you can go, kind of go, well, how about pizza? All right. That works, doesn't it? See, it works. Okay. So use these to get what you want. Again, don't say you learned them here. All right. Let's now talk just for a few. Well, actually, you know what? Let's let me think about this. I'm gonna look and see how much more of this we have. Okay. It, yeah. See, it works. Oh, I think in, in the last few minutes of the class, at least for this part, I want to talk about group polarization, okay? Um, and we're going to go back to some pretty famous uh, uh, studies about, and, and the reason why I bring this up is I see a lot of arguments on Facebook <laughs> where the two people just become further and further apart, and they tend to then end up um, um, uh, even in a worse argument than they got into. And this is an example of what's called group polarization, okay? So in this situation, we're going to measure prejudice, and we're going to have people who are high prejudice or low prejudice, and then we're going to have a speaker come in, okay? And uh, the high prejudice person is going to speak to the low prejudice prejudice people and say, this is why you should be discriminatory towards this given group. Okay. And then in the sec, in the other situation, we're going to have people who are low prejudice to go into a high prejudice situation and say, this is why we shouldn't discriminate towards this other group. Okay. Now, uh, the rules of logic say that, uh, you know, if you have counter information such as A plus B does not actually equal C because of new evidence, you should change your mind, right? That's what logic dictates, dictates. But what we actually found in a measure of attitude is having someone with high prejudice present information to a low prejudice group, it increases that person's low prejudice. They, they become more non stating non-discrimination. And we find that high prejudice people become more extreme in their prejudice when they hear information counter to their belief system, okay? Now this shouldn't be surprising because we see polarizations with liberals and, and conservatives all the time, that the more conservative news that a liberal hears, the more liberal they become, the more conservative news the that that uh, the more liberal news that a conservative hears, the more conservative they become. Okay, and it's not surprising that this happens, but I would encourage you to save yourself some anxiety to think about that if you engage in uh, famous Facebook arguments and the like. So kind of keep that in mind. And so, huh? Instagram, TikTok, 
<laughs> I forget that I'm getting old and that Facebook is becoming an old man's thing or an old person's thing. I need to update my my social medias. Okay. The other thing is, is when you engage someone of, of a different belief system or attitude and whatnot, it's important to do it without what's called a cognitive load. Okay. Cognitive load is when, when you have so much on your mind that your brain is becoming overwhelmed. Maybe it's high stress, high anxiety. Maybe you're trying to figure out uh, how you're going to write an essay paper, something like that. That's called a cognitive load. Okay. And what is known as the Shelley studies is what we're going to do is we're going to measure people's uh, uh, prejudice level. Okay. And uh, of course, um, uh, when, when we have a person act the way they usually act. Okay. Um, so in, in this case, what we do is we have someone of an, for example, opposite race, maybe someone that one group is really prejudiced against, okay? And we have them go pick up a folder at the end of a hallway. And as they're coming back, we have the person, uh, the Confederate who is, who is maybe the target of prejudice, drop something. And what we're measuring is helping behavior versus discriminatory behaviors. Okay, and in a non-cognitive load situation, for exactly as you would predict, people who were high prejudice acted high prejudice. People who were low prejudice uh, acted low prejudice. Okay, in the second situation, however, we asked both the high and low pre prejudice people to act prejudice. Okay. And indeed, even the people who uh, were low in prejudice would act prejudice and vice versa. If we ask, ask the high prejudice people to not be prejudiced, sure enough, they could behave in a non-prejudice way. But this is without introducing a cognitive load. Okay, So in the next situation, what we're going to do is we're going to have the person walk down the hallway and we're going to have them count backward, backwards from 100 in sevens and fours. So I got to remember how to do this. So they have to walk and say 193, 89, 82, 75. And so they have to do that and they have to do it kind of out loud and in their head as they move from one position to the next. Okay. And in this case, uh, we ask them, we do the same thing. We have the person do something that would either engage helping behavior or prejudice behavior, okay? And what we found is irregardless of whether the person um, measures low prejudice or high prejudice, both groups act prejudice, okay? Meaning that they are less likely to enter into helping behavior. They're more likely to do scowling faces, non-contact faces, all of those kinds of things, okay? And this is this is kind of the results of the Shelley studies, and we'll end with all this negativity with this, this, this end note, is from the Shelley studies and studies after this one, we found that prejudice is a choice, and it's something that human beings have to consciously and purposely act towards. Because when you take away the person's ability to think about their reaction, they'll react in that discriminatory way. Okay, So I want you to all kind of think about that, um, that, that really when it comes to discrimination and prejudice, it's a choice and we have to make conscious effort not to be something to think about. Okay, So let me uh, get out of here. Stop sharing.